This is what bothers me about kind of the way these articles are written. It's implying like this level of, it's just not real. It's like nobody eats only beef. By the time we get through eating lots of different whole foods, that might include iceberg lettuce and might include things like pineapple. We end up being able to get to 100%, even if not any of those single individual foods are quote, as good as beef liver or as good as watercress. And that's what I mean is like, there's no one food that defines our health. It's all of our foods in our diet that define our health. Hello and welcome to the Consistency Project with E.C. Sinkowski. My name is Patrick Cummings and every episode I have the privilege of having a discussion with E.C. on subject matters that range from nutrition to fitness to the choices we can all make to live a healthier, more functional life. By exploring both the principles at play and the actions worth carrying out as a result, it's our goal to get you thinking, get you moving, and get you taking more consistent steps toward optimizing your well-being. Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week. Hello, how are you, E.C.? Ready to give some hot cakes. Ready. We'll get back into our hot cakes. I, I've said this, this is my favorite format, um, but mostly just because it gives me an excuse to like go on the internet and find things that are confusing to me and, and have a space to ask you about them. Um, so hot cakes is when, as I just said, uh, I send you uh, three things I've found on the internet uh, as of recent that I'm curious about or that in the least I am interested in your thoughts on. Oftentimes there are, I'm confused by them. Uh, a lot of times they're just like, oh, I'm really curious what EC's take on this particular idea. So what we tend to do is we just go through each one of them. Um, we, uh, I do my best to sort of strip away if there's like who said this and where I found it because generally that's irrelevant. Um, and then we'll just sort of ha have some fun with these, uh, with these three. You ready? Oh, yeah. All right, so we're gonna, um, just as a, as a preview, we're gonna talk about eating food in the right order, the healthiest food in the world, and then a question about increasing volume and intensity, uh, um, but decreasing energy expenditure in our fitness. So those are the three we're gonna talk about today. First one first, eating food in the right order. This is from uh, somebody on Instagram who's very popular. She's got mm -hmm. uh, two, over two and a half million followers on Instagram. Uh, and she's a New York Times bestseller, so she is clearly very influential. And the video, it's just a short clip from a podcast she was on. Um, and I'm just going to read basically what she says because it's like 10 seconds. So, And then um, we can kind of get into it. So she says that she says, eat your food in the right order. So next time you're faced with a meal, there's something amazing that you should know. If you eat the ingredients in the meal in a specific order, you can reduce the glucose spike of that meal by up to 75% without changing how much you're eating or what you're eating. Just the order has a massive impact on your glucose. So you can still eat the same meal with way less spikes and way less consequences. So the order is veggies first, proteins and fast, fats second, and starches and sugars last. Now we've talked mm -hmm. about glucose, we've talked about, you know, glucose spikes mm -hmm. before. We've got an episode on that. Yeah. But for me, the, the thing that popped out to me was just this like magical order of eating specific foods first and how strange a dinner mate you must be to do this very thing. But I would yeah. love your thoughts. Well, you're right. Um, you know, the, the specific order, I guess, is new or different than what we've talked about. But it, it really comes back to the same concept of that, like, this is totally irrelevant to anybody's health outcome. Totally irrelevant. And I went to this person's website. And again, not everybody shares everything on their website. I don't, I don't know this person well. I don't follow this person's content with any sort of great detail. But something like this, to me, screams, screams, they don't actually have any clients. Zero clients. This is totally irrelevant to making any real lasting habit change that matters and helps the person. Um, and, and totally irrelevant to what scientific data matters. Okay, let's just say that the specific order reduces the glucose, the 75% as stated here. It may for some people, glucose responses tend to be quite variable such that this might not actually happen for everybody, but whatever. Let's say that there is somebody where the order actually reduces the glucose spike after meal, irrelevant to their long-term health, irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So it's just to me, it's like one, the science is wrong, but let's just say the science is right for the sake of the argument and okay, it then screams to me just like totally impractical for people because this is not the struggle that people are dealing with. It's not that they have the perfectly number of veggies lined up followed by the correct number of fats followed by the correct number of starts and sugars. They don't have the right foods in their diet. <laughs> and it's like totally missing the boat. Like if, if the only thing that came down for people in their health was getting the right order right and that was going to make some massive difference, I mean, we would be, we would have like zero health issues out there. 
<laughs> in terms of preventable nutrition solve. one. What is the, you know, I think your point about the, the sustainability and the, I think that that is interesting. Didn't, I hadn't thought of that. I was mostly thinking about, like, is there any validity to this argument? Let alone, like, I didn't even get, my, my brain didn't even get to, is this practical in any way? <laughs> um, so that's interesting that, that I, and I think obviously that you're right. I'm curious, what is the appeal like, like I said, two and a half million followers on Instagram. Like, like, what is the appeal to an argument like this? Is it is it just that like the the demonization of glucose and of glucose mm-hmm. spiking that people are just like that's my problem and I must have a solution and well I guess I can eat my my broccoli first if that's what you tell me to do. Yeah, I don't know why some of these accounts get so popular. Um, there's plenty of other accounts quite like this, which kind of incorrectly extrapolate data um, to what people should do with their nutrition. And I I don't really know. I think there is a little bit of, I've found the secret. Now I know why I'm not getting my results because I haven't been eating my foods in the right order. You know, it, it's, it's nice for us to have a simple solution that kind of explains a problem. And so I get that. Like, and I feel like this is why we latch on to diets that have very specific rules because it gives us this clarity in this confusing space, right? You know, you just have to do this one thing and it's like, oh, great. <laughs> now I know what to do. Um, and so I think that's some of the appeal for sure. You said something interesting about like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you went to her website, you you got whatever you could glean from the website, and you were quite sure that she has no clients, <laughs> which is really interesting to me, because like we live in an uh, at a time now where somebody can build a massive audience and stay because of because of the nature of media and the nature of social media and the nature of network effects and, and virality, they never have to really go deep enough with any individual or at least enough individuals to know like, oh, this, this only makes sense in theory. This actually doesn't make sense past the first week of, you know, my, you know, my advice going into action. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's that, you know, that's interesting that there's, we can, people can get by without being in the trenches. They can get huge without ever going deep, I guess is what I mean. It's like they can go straight to, to, to breadth without ever spending any time in the depth. Yeah, and I'm happy to throw out this name. I mean, Liver King's another example of that one. Yeah. You know, he doesn't yep, have clients. Right. Good call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I yep. mean, he's got supplements. Yeah, right, he sells he's got product. supplements, right? Um, yeah. 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 And here's the thing. The body is so robust in terms of like, you know, I always talk about like the 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight level for protein. Yes. I think that's a good number. Yes. I think a lot of people can get the results they want. There's so many reasons why I love that number. Yet, as we recently said in another podcast, and I try to also illustrate, there's also a wide strike zone such that people can come in with very hyper specific ideas and it's still works, works in quotes, fine enough maybe for them, or even enough if somebody really follows it because the body is so resilient. So can somebody eat their food in this order and be healthy? Yes, but it's like kind of missing the point of what actually matters. And so this is also what I think is a little bit tough is there is really wide strike zones on how much of each nutrient you can have and how which different foods exactly that sometimes it sounds like somebody's come up with like the perfect combination it's just because we're so resilient that that still falls within the realm of like you can survive (laughs) yeah and the wide strike zone is not conducive to modern marketing where you have to like get very specific amplify the problem such that you can sell the solution to that problem. And I've joked with you before about this, but like you're a great example of, of like you just said, like the, the wide strike zone, fruits and vegetables in the right amount, pro, you know, proper amount of protein. That's harder to get attention in the world that we live in. It's harder to yes. get, it's harder to get people to slow down unless you scare the crap out of them and saying more fruits and vegetables, accurate amount of calories, accurate amount of protein it doesn't scare people to stop enough, but, oh, I'm eating food in the wrong order. Shoot. Tell me the right order, please, is scary enough to stop people from scrolling for at least a few minutes. Totally. And I, I do want to say, like, I, you know, I believed a lot of things that are wrong. And so I totally understand that 
like wanting to make sense of all of the different diets you've tried and all of the different frustration that you've had with things not working and stuff like that. So it's like, that's why this stuff I think is so powerful because it does grab our attention for that moment and be like, okay, this is it. This is what I was missing. (laughs) And I totally empathize with that. But I want to tell you from a science-based perspective, so much of this stuff is completely irrelevant. Okay, so I don't have to eat my veggies first, then my protein, (laughs) then my fats, and then my starches. And I don't even know how it would get my sugars last. Does that just mean dessert last? I think we've got that part figured out. But I don't think this individual would recommend dessert. But anyway. (laughs) Okay. Right, because that would presumably spike your glucose. Okay. Next one we've got in our hotcakes is uh, an article from a mainstream. uh, It doesn't matter. This is from Vogue. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how I got an article from Vogue. It just happens. The internet gives me things. I know, right? Yeah. Um, And this this grabbed my attention because this is like a typical sort of uh, headline type thing. It's like the headline was most nutrient dense food in the world. Um, and so just like it's a very again, it's it's from Vogue, so it's not a very deep article. But um, in effect, it says uh, in the search for healthiest food in the world, researchers at William Patterson University in New Jersey examined 41 types of fruit and vegetables and compared them with each other. The winner officially titled the most nutrient dense food in the world may surprise you. The superfood par excellence can actually be grown and thrive in your home, even if you have a garden. Drum roll, please. It is watercress. <laughs> <laughs> With a total of 100 points, the winner in the ranking of the healthiest food beat even Chinese cabbage, which was 91.99 points. I won't go through the whole thing. The answer is, like I said, watercress. So I've got some questions, but I'd love your thoughts on watercress. Do you love it? Have you, intro- have you introduced it to every single one of your meals? <laughs> oh, man. This is, this is actually a great example of what we were just talking about, how oh my gosh, like I haven't been eating the most healthiest food in the world. That is now going to change my outcome, right? It's again, almost this really attractive that like I've been missing the one thing. And if I could just remind people my principle five, it's never one thing. So you're never going to come to this conclusion of like, I'm just missing this one thing, like watercress. Um, You know, we're not healthy because of a food in our diet. We're healthy because of all of the foods in our diet. And so again, this is kind of that too much of a reductionist approach. I mean, I guess I just sort of said that with it's never one thing, but it's overly fixating on one thing to potentially the detriment of what the rest of your diet looks like. Um, And watercress is fine, just like any of our leafy greens. It's going to have a high amount of vitamins and minerals per its weight, going to have a high amount of vitamins and minerals for its calories. Um, And so just like all of them, great, they're healthy foods, include them in your diet. But like, is somebody unhealthy? I don't know if I've ever eaten watercress. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, I don't, I yeah, I don't know either. And so it's like this idea that okay, this is this is the one food that's keeping us all from healthy. And what's really great is in the article that you sent me. I caught at the end. Um, it's talking about how like you know, 100 grams of watercress covers most yeah. of your vitamin C need, and then. However, you shouldn't consume that much watercress as the essential mustard oils can cause bladder, kidney, and stomach irritation if consumed in excess. So it's like a perfect example of like, okay, now we're overly fixating on watercress, but guess what? We shouldn't eat too much of it, you know? So it's like, how much do we really need of this thing? Anyway, it was just sort of funny. It's like, okay, but don't eat too much. Right. This is exactly why I think that that was the clincher for me. That was like, okay, I'm talking yeah. easy about this. There was that last paragraph yeah. of, yeah, but don't, but don't overdo it. And overdoing it is like, it's, I think it's like a large bowl of watercress, which I don't know anybody who's going to go eat a large bowl, but here's, here's maybe a slightly more serious, but not really. Mm. Um, nutrient density. Mm. When I, like when I clicked on the thing, I was like most nutrient dense food in the world. My, what I've learned is that something like liver is the most nutrient dense food in the world. And then below that is like other organ meats. And then it's, you know, whatever, uh, steak, and then somewhere chicken and somewhere down there is watercress. So I was confused when I when I when the answer was watercress. And so am I just misunderstanding what nutrient density is? Am I misunderstanding? Or did the is Vogue misrepresenting what the most nutrient dense food is? Or like, why? Why is there a bit of confusion there? Is it me? Is it Vogue? Is it us in general? It's going to depend on a few things. One, you could define nutrient density on a per calorie basis. It's typically, though, on a per gram basis. But it also depends on what nutrient you're looking at. So oftentimes we hear about beef liver because it's the most nutrient dense, specifically for vitamin A. 
where something like a watercress might trump beef liver in vitamin K. And so this is why, again, we don't want to get too zoomed in um, on any one food because we have to remember that we need a, a wide array of vitamins and minerals. Vitamins and minerals alone are 28, and then we've got protein and, and, and fat to take care of too, and fiber. But so this is just it. It's like, well, on what nutrient are we comparing these foods? Um, from a broader context, though, I like to remind people, and I love that you brought up the beef liver example because it's, you know, again, vitamin A is is through the roof in beef liver. And so I was just looking up the stats. Now, this is from Wikipedia, so I'm assuming they're pulling in the right data from, from USDA. But basically for a 100-gram serving of beef liver, which would be kind of like a typical amount of, you know, a chicken or steak if you had it, in that amount, it has 813% of your vitamin A needs for the day. It's like, why, why do I need 813% of my vitamin A needs in any single day? A, and then B, let's say that I had a smaller serving size such that I got 100% of my vitamin A in a smaller serving of beef liver. It sort of implies that you're not going to eat anything else that day. And the same thing is true for watercress. It's saying that this 100 gram serving can get you all of your vitamin C. It's like, well, did you only plan on eating 100 grams of watercress today? Because the other foods you have in your... <laughs> The other foods you have in your diet are going to round out your nutrient needs. And so this is what, you know, you know, we're joking and I'm making light of it. This is what bothers me about kind of the way these articles are written. It's implying like this level of, it's just not real. It's like nobody eats only beef liver. I guess if we were in a scenario where food was very scarce and we didn't get um, ample food selections and we were probably under eating calories because food was so scarce. We'd want to be really selective of the foods that we eat because we do have to make sure that we get enough vitamin A and whatever, vitamin K. And so maybe watercress and beef liver would be up there. But thankfully for most of us, we do have a, a wide array of foods that we can eat and we have ample calories in our diet such that by the time we get through eating lots of different whole foods that might include iceberg lettuce and might include things like pineapple, we end up being able to get to 100%, even if not any of those single individual foods are, quote, as good as beef liver or as good as watercress. And that's what I mean is like, there's no one food that defines our health. It's all of our foods in our diet that define our health. So would you, would you make the argument that paying any attention to nutrient density is kind of unnecessary or perhaps a, a waste of time? Or is there still value in understanding nutrient density as it relates to different foods? but not clearly, as we've been talking about, not like worrying too much about, am I getting enough watercress or beef liver yeah. in my diet? I think what we preach about all the time is basically the extent that you have to understand nutrient density, that whole unprocessed foods are going to have more vitamins and minerals and fiber and phytochemicals than anything processed. And that's about the extent that you have to kind of care about it. You know, I guess, I guess too, maybe having a diversity of those foods in your diet covers your base as well. You know, like, you have some beef and have some broccoli because there's different vitamins in them. But beyond that, the pieces come together quite well when you have a diverse array of whole unprocessed foods where you don't have to get too in the weeds. And, and, and that's why I might keep my recommendations so, so basic. The pieces come together quite well so long as you kind of have a, a, a relatively good variety of whole unprocessed foods. That is enough. Sorry, watercress. I am not eating 100 grams of you today. I don't, <laughs> Watch out I don't for bladder know, irritation. I imagine that's a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, third and last hot cake that we've got. I wanted to throw one fitness related one. This yeah. is something I came across on Instagram. This is from a uh, he, he says he's a coach to world champion athletes and teams. Uh, and he's got about 80,000 followers on Instagram. Not that that makes him special, but it is a useful uh, barometer of our people paying attention to him. So here's the post that uh, that I came across that I thought was uh, interesting. He said in it, trying to burn as many calories as you can in every workout is a bad idea. You should be doing the exact opposite. Make your goal to get in as much volume and intensity as your body needs to improve, but do it at the lowest energy cost possible. This leaves the body with more energy available for recovery, which is what it needs to turn your workouts into results. And I'm just going to read a little bit from his caption because uh, it adds a little bit more context, which is the more energy you use during training, the more your body will adapt by reducing RMR, de uh, decreasing your motivation to work, to move outside the gym and increasing your drive to eat more food. Burning too many calories in your training can also mean there is less energy available to recover. Without energy being driven towards recovery, you won't see the results of your hard work in the first place. So overall, I'd love your take on it. But my one question or my, my sort of first question is about 
your thoughts on like, do we go to the gym? Do we exercise? Do we train to burn calories? Should we be thinking about it in that sort of perspective or through that lens? Or do we or should we be thinking about training, going to the gym, exercise as an effort of amongst many things, uh, building muscle mass and worry and worrying less about what it's doing calorically and and thinking more about food as it relates to caloric intake and caloric um, output and leaving the gym for strength building, uh, cardiovascular building, et cetera. Like, where do you come down on that? Or maybe maybe the answer is like, yes, to all of it. Yeah, no, I prefer the latter. I mean, I agree with, I don't want to say 100% of this post and caption, but I agree with a lot of it. And that's generally how I approach things too. like focus on performance, focus on working hard in the gym, and then the body composition results follow. Um, where I do totally agree that you do these really big caloric deficits, you don't have the energy to push hard, yet the energy to push hard is how you get the muscle mass to then burn more calories every day. So it's almost the caloric goal becomes a byproduct or a side effect of working hard in the gym. And yes, this is true for the weight loss clients. They want to burn more in the gym, but they should focus on performance. They shouldn't focus on burning calories. And some of this comes down to the fact that some of the goal or some of the workouts that build the most lean mass in the long term don't burn that many calories in the moment, right? When you do back squat five by five, if you compare that to how many calories you would burn in a spin cycle class for 60 minutes, you're going to burn more calories in the spin cycle class. But I'm going to tell you in the long term, the five by five back squat has bigger payoff to how many calories you burn every day, assuming you do it, you know, more than one time. Um, and so, yeah, I love the idea of not focusing on calories to work out, focusing on fueling performance and intensity, and then the calories and typically end up working out more in your favor. It's interesting to me, like I, I and I know that I'm relative out, outlier or outsider to why most people go to the gym, but do a lot of people do in your sense and your experience, obviously through the many years you've been involved in and around CrossFit, like are people walking into CrossFit gyms thinking, this is the salute, like I'm going to burn so many calories this, you know, in this hour, or I'm going to become a member here so I can do these workouts. And I'm going to burn a ton of calories. Is that the, is that, is that the, the, the mindset that a lot of people bring into a gym or bring into CrossFit or really just bring into whatever fitness program they're, they're kind of diving into? You know, I, I don't know. I might be biased. I do think there's a slight difference for when people go into CrossFit. I do think that's a little bit more aligning with a fitness goal maybe a quality of life goal than it is a weight loss goal. I might just be wrong. That just might be a super biased opinion um, versus a kind of a traditional globo gym where it's cardio, you know, you go do the cardio. I think that's just more ingrained in that gym culture of like, well, I got to do go burn my, you know, do the cardio to burn fat where because there's such a blending of it in CrossFit and the focus is on recording your workout scale uh, scores, not looking in the mirror around you. I think there is a slightly different shift on, on why people are going to the gym. That doesn't mean people don't want to lose weight or change their body comps as you go to CrossFit. But I do think generally there's a little bit more just embedded in the culture and the program that's about performing versus aesthetic. Yeah, I'm curious if, if for you to just help me kind of parse this language, make your goal to get in as much volume and intensity as your body needs to improve, but at the lowest energy cost possible. Is that not describing CrossFit without using that word? Or is there nuance in there that I just, I'm just not smart enough to, to see or understand? Yeah, I mean, I think what he's basically saying is you want to be able to work hard. And so if you're in a big caloric deficit, you're not going to be able to do that. He's saying energy cost is like, how big is your deficit? So uh, to me, I don't think it's quite like saying it's CrossFit. To me, it's saying Again, focus on performance. Don't focus on how many calories you're burning that day. And it's really my approach that I recommend with my clients is we first focus on what you're eating now. We take a really minor deficit and just play that consistency piece while all the while keeping up our workouts because that's what's ultimately going to drive results in the long term. It's these crash diets where people just like get on the bike for another hour to see the calories click by and then under eat. They end up not really moving the needle in the long term. Last question, sticking on CrossFit because... It's one of the few things in the world that I understand. Um, I, I think one of the things that that CrossFit gym owners and coaches sometimes bemoan is like the desire from their members to just like come in and get a good sweat on, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to work for forty five minutes or fifty minutes, and on the and on the days where it's like we're going to spend some time doing that five by five back squat that you mentioned, 
um, oh, I might, I might not go that day, <laughs> right? It's not the, it's not the long kind of sweat fest that I, that I really like. So that's, that's going to be my rest day this week, or I'll find some other excuse not to show up. What do you like in this, in line with this, this advice, which at least to the degree that you agree uh, with it, you do like, what advice might you have to explain or, or advice to coaches and gym owners so that they can kind of explain why, kind of what you just said about the five by five back squat and the value of that in addition to the value of the the longer workouts like how do you how do you make that understandable to somebody who might sort of have that old thought of like i'm just here to burn calories because that's what i need to do to lose weight or look better yeah i mean you know education is always a great start kind of just saying what i say i do think there's also sometimes especially for beginners we talked about how beginners you know, 10 rep max, this is a long time ago in a podcast, but their 10 rep max doesn't look very different from their one rep max. And so oftentimes when beginners come into these strength days, they truly don't get a workout like your top athletes do simply because they don't have the nervous system to kind of recruit all the musculature that they have. And so it is very easy for beginners to not see the value. And so this is where sometimes, I think it was in a quick bites we talked about, but this is where you might want to give a little bit more focus on some of the beginners in the class on those strength days and maybe make them do sets of eight instead of sets of three or something like that and trying to keep progressing their weight a little bit because it's going to be hard for them to understand the value. And there is a very real level of, you no, know, they don't they don't work to the same level as the, as the advanced people. And so this is where some education comes into play. Second to that, I, I think the best thing that a gym owner can have, well, I guess besides them practicing what they preach, but to have someone else in the um, class who is a very top high level performer who is following the class and doing the five by five back squat and then not going off and doing the filthy 50 after who's just sort of comes in. Yeah, I do strength day on strength day. I have the aesthetic. I'm a top athlete and recognizes the importance. It's kind of like that leading by example, but instead of the coach doing it, it's kind of like a, a member within the community I think is great. And I hate to paint with a broad brush, but that's really great for, for women to see that, to see kind of the strong female who does the lifting of the heavy weight and what that really looks like. I think men wrap their head around that a little bit faster. All right. Love it. Thank you for satisfying my curiosities as always with these episodes. Uh, thank you everybody out there for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Be sure to subscribe or follow the show wherever you are listening or watching this. So you do not miss a future episode. EC and I will be back next week for another episode of the consistency project.